I am Vicki Howe, I'm the Community Missions Minister, and we are so glad that you're here. I don't know how many of you were able to participate yesterday in Engage Middle Tennessee Service Day. Raise your hand if you were here. I recognize a lot of faces. There were some amazing things that happened. We had, as you saw, close to a thousand people serving across our six campuses yesterday in some way, shape, and form. And that is amazing. That is absolutely amazing. God is doing some great things that we're getting to be a part of. Here from this campus alone, we were able to have the Apathy Effect exhibit. We were talking about human trafficking, making survivor kits that are gonna be available to our survivors. We were able to pack 750 fuel bags so kids can have food this summer. We were able to do so many things, turn over clothes in our Metro Safe House, painting, People were gardening in different ways. There were lots of opportunities and things going on. And so we thank you so much for being a part. But you know what? We are just scratching the surface. So if you didn't have a chance to serve yesterday, or you're just like, I didn't have enough. Give me more. I want more. Trust me, there are lots of things and ways to be able to get involved. And so if you're not plugged in with a life group, I'm going to encourage you to seek out discipleship. Get plugged in with a life group. If you are, and, or if you just want to reach out to the missions department as well, we can get you plugged in with opportunities that are going on all the time. But thank you again. One chance that you're going to have, a, have that opportunity to serve here in a few weeks, you may have seen a slide pop up for CAFO, Christian Alliance for Orphans. That's happening in just a few weeks. We'll have 2,500 of our closest friends from around the world that are leading out in orphan care movements. Or orphan care is just a part of their life. You have a chance to plug in and just welcome them, help them get from place to place, help them get food, help them find where room 2,500 is, and they're looking for it. But if you'd like to get plugged in, help to volunteer for that. Details to do that are in your bulletin. And so just read those details, let us know, and we can get you connected. But guys, like I said, God is doing something great in Middle Tennessee, and we get to be a part. So thank you. Thank you for participating. If you are with us here for the first time, there's a communication card in the back of the seat in front of you. Just reach out and uh, fill that out for us. And when the offering plate comes by, drop it in. But thank you for coming today. Stand up, and let's just greet each other this morning.
return to you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Lord Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. We thank you for your steadfast love that never changes. Sing together. Man of sorrows and of God, by his own betrayed, the sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus' name.
have all of his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself by making peace through the blood of his cross, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Come behold the wondrous mystery, the God of life slain by death for you and me to, ra to raise again on the third day. Hebrews 7 tells us that Jesus lives to intercede for us. He comes to the Father on our behalf. That's what we get to do right now. If you're new to this service, we call this our prayer and altar, um, just a time to quiet your heart be still before our Father in heaven. Let him speak to you and while you speak to him. 
Our pastor will be kneeling down front. There will be some who will gather around him to pray for him as he brings God's word to us. But whatever ever is on your heart, whatever Holy Spirit brings to you this morning, bring that to the Father knowing that he loves you, knowing that he hears you. Let's pray together. Spirit, thank you for hearing the prayers of your people. Jesus, we praise you for this sacrifice, for the love that you showed us on the cross. No greater love than that. We look to you this morning. We praise you this morning. We lift up our pastor to you. Let's let you speak through him. I'm going to speak boldly the truth that you have uh, proclaimed to him this week as he preaches that to us. We love you and thank you for the chance to gather with your people. And it's in your holy name I pray. Amen. Next Sunday is Easter, and we will have a lot of people on this campus. We're praying so anyway. And we will have several worship services, and we won't have one at 9.30. We'll have one at 8.30 and 10. You want to put the times up there? Because I can't ever remember them. I, I just know I have to be here at 7. Uh, 7, 8.30, and 10, 11.30 here in the worship center. Whoa, don't do that to me. 9.30 and 11.11 in Hudson Hall. Now, I made the deal with you. If you're coming next Sunday, I really want you to come at 7 o'clock or 11.30. Unless you're meeting somebody. Now, if you're going to meet somebody, then that's fine. You can meet them any, any uh, time that is agreeable to them. It's hard to walk in a church when you don't know anybody, even if you go to church as much as I do. It's still hard to go into a different church. It's a lot easier when somebody, hey, I'll meet you there or I'll pick you up. And so if you're bringing somebody who's not already a member, Don't walk in here pointing at each other going, I brought him, I brought her. No, that won't work, okay? Easter is one of the easiest times to ask people to church. So do it. If you don't, I'll see you at 7 o'clock. It's that easy. Now, I do have a friend at the place where we work out who's invited everybody in the gymnasium uh, to come so they don't have to come at 7 o'clock. And they keep telling me every time I see them, I'm not coming at 7. I've got a lot of people coming. So, 
That works. That works. Listen, um, let, me tell you, let me tell you how this week's going to go for a couple of families around here. Most of the time, it is the dad who is holding out. Most of the time. Statistics tell us most of the time, it is the dad who doesn't really want to get involved in church. Mom and kids are saying, can we go to church? We want to go to church. Our friends go to church. And he will say, okay, it is Easter. I will go. And he will go. Now, what happens if that father pulls into our parking lot and can't find a parking space? What happens if he walks in and cannot find a seat? He will do the same thing he does at every restaurant he goes into. He will turn around, he will leave, he will go home. He won't go to another church, he will go home. He won't come back to another service, he will go home. And he will start telling everybody, nobody goes there anymore, it's too crowded. And next year at Easter, he won't even try. Now more than you want to admit, more than I want to tell you, that story will happen a thousand times this coming week. That's why we want you to sit in the middle of the pew, okay? When you move in, you sit in the middle of the pew. So when you come in, there's places for people. So when people come in, there's places for them to sit. That's why we want you to park away from the building so that the parking places that are left are near the building. That's why we ask you to do those things because we hear the stories of people who come and say, hey, I couldn't get in. There was no place for me to sit. Okay, so that's why we do that. Because, folks, what's wrong in America, political parties cannot solve. It takes the gospel of Jesus Christ, Him crucified. That's it. And that's the message. That's the message we'll be sharing next Sunday and any Sunday after that, that Jesus is risen and He's alive and it makes a difference now. Now, we've got a lot of services, a lot of musicians, a lot of things going on next, next Easter. We've got it happening in all of our campuses. Uh, they're all scrambling because several of our campuses are at space capacity. Aren't these good problems to have? If Jesus is going to give you something hard, aren't these the ones you want to solve? Uh, our new pastor at Lachlan, David Hanna, will be preaching for the first time on the campus at Lachlan Springs. That will start next Sunday. Uh, you saw some of the things that we were celebrating with, um, uh, with, with the, uh, Engage Middle Tennessee. We do all of this and a lot more because of your faithfulness to this moment. We have the resources we need when God opens up a, an opportunity or He shows us a challenge. We can respond because of your faithfulness to this moment. So as the rest has come forward here in the main sanctuary, we'll continue to worship as we give. If you join us in Overflow in Baskin Chapel, we welcome you, and the ushers will be coming there as well. So let's continue to worship as we give together. Lord Jesus, receive the gifts of your children. We give them in celebration of all you have done for us to this moment. Uh, we think now about the times you came through, answered prayer sometimes before we even knew what we were praying, and you were there. So we give in celebration. We bring our tithes and offerings in praise. We're eager to see how you will use what we bring to you to bring glory to your Son, for it is in his name we pray. Amen. Family, this is Allison. And as I was meeting with her this morning, she said, this is going to be fun. She is excited about being baptized. And she said right before Mike started praying, she said, I can't wait. This is going to be so fun. So, Allison, we're glad that you're here this morning. Allison has participated in Vacation Bible School over the last few years. And last fall, she went through our new Christians class. And so, she understands fully what it means to follow Jesus Christ. And so, today, uh, just a week before her ninth birthday, she wants to be baptized today. So, I want to ask you this morning, Allison, is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? Well, based upon your profession of faith, I baptize you today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Congratulations.
Have you ever tried to explain to anybody or convince somebody that you are who you are if you don't have any ID? And that's tougher than you think it is. Um, several years ago, I had my passport stolen when I was in London. Trying to convince the State Department you are who you say you are, they don't care how many times you say really. <laughs> that doesn't impress them. And you know what else happens? If you Google Mike Glenn, you don't get me. You get a retired NBA point guard <laughs> who used to play for the Atlanta Hawks. We don't look anything alike. <laughs> and if you're looking at Google and looking at me, you're going to say, you're, 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 you're not Mike Glenn. How do you prove who you are if you do not have a government-issued ID? Jerusalem wanted to know who Jesus was. And on this Sunday, we remember, we celebrate the day that he came to Jerusalem, the triumphant entry, Palm Sunday, the beginning of his last week alive here on earth. What does he tell them? How does he prove it? That's an interesting story. And we'll pick it up in Matthew 21. Stand with me in honor of God's Word. When they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus said to his two disciples and told them, Go into the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. And this took place so that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. Tell daughter Zion, Look, your king is coming to you gentle, mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. And the disciples went and did just as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, and they laid their garments and the robes on them, and he sat on them. And a very large crowd spread their robes on the road. Others were cutting branches of the trees, spreading them on the road. And the crowd who went ahead of them and those who followed them kept shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. He who comes in the name of the Lord is the blessed one. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was shaken, saying, Who is this? And the crowds kept saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. And he entered Jerusalem, and the whole city was shaken, asking, Who is this? This is God's word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. As you came to Jerusalem so long ago, now, this morning, you come to us. And we pray, unlike Jerusalem, we will know the answer to who you are. And our lives will be forever different for it. And we pray this in your name. Amen. <laughs> they could see him coming. His entrance was no surprise. You see, Jerusalem was a fortified city. It had a wall. It had a Roman garrison. It had guards posted at the gates. It had soldiers on the walls. And they could see him coming. I wonder what they thought when they saw Jesus riding on this colt, his disciples behind him, around him. The people in front of him singing praise, Hosanna to the son of David, the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna. I wondered what they thought. Who is this? They must have wondered. How do we respond? Well, this is the prophet. This is Jesus. This is the one that has upset everybody in Jerusalem. This is the one that the religious leaders are, are so concerned with. This is the one our politicians have been talking about. Why is he coming? 
Doesn't he know there's nothing in this city for him but trouble? Oh, sure, he knew he had been warned. His disciples had told him on more than one occasion, don't go to Jerusalem. Your enemies are there. We can't protect you in Jerusalem. In the countryside, we can see if the enemy is coming. We can hide you in the hills. We, we, can, we can run from those who are, who are trying to hurt you. But in the city, we can't protect you. We can't be there. Your enemies are in the city. Your enemies have friends in the city. Jesus, don't go. The others had told Jesus, don't come here. It's one thing if you're preaching out in the country. It's one thing if you're a little country bumpkin preacher who's talking about all the sin that's in the big city. We've had those before. We'll have those again. But when you come to this city, when you come to our turf, and you start talking about who has power and who has authority, then we will have to show you, Jesus, who has authority, who has power. Don't come, Jesus. Rome had told him. Don't come. Don't come and let your followers proclaim you to be Lord, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. We are Romans. Jerusalem belongs to Rome. And in Rome there is one God. There is one Lord. And that God's name, that Lord's name is Caesar. Do you know that when the early Christians were persecuted, they were not charged with treason? They were charged with atheism. They would not say Jesus, they would not say Caesar is Lord. They proclaimed Jesus is Lord. They would not say Caesar is Lord. And they were charged with atheism. Don't come here, Jesus. In Rome, there is one Lord, and his name is Caesar. But Jesus comes anyway. That's the thing about Jesus, isn't it? He won't stay where you put him. Do you know how many stories of Jesus start that he was walking from this place to that place, or he went from this village to that village? He was on the road and somebody came up and started a conversation. Our Jesus is always moving. He's always coming. And that's a problem for most of us because most of us want an experience with Jesus. We want to freeze that moment. We want to put Jesus in a box or a nice display case, and we want to know where Jesus is. We want to live our life here, and we want to go back to that moment when when we have that, that significant moment with, with Jesus, if we ever get messed up, if we ever get confused, we want to go over to find Jesus exactly where we left him. And that's a problem, isn't it? Because he won't stay where you put him. You know, Southern Baptists, I love us. I do. But we have a problem with this thing we call sanctification, this, this thing that once you are born again, you're supposed to live again, okay, that you're supposed to continue to grow in the likeness of Christ. We don't know what to do with that. So here's the typical Southern Baptist life. The typical Southern Baptist life is you have an experience when you were seven or eight years old, and you get baptized, and it is real as a seven or eight-year-old experience can be, but nobody disciples you, nobody teaches you, nobody tells you you're going to have more experiences like this. So you have a crisis when you're 15, because when you're 15 and you're trying to live with an eight-year-old understanding of God, that doesn't work. So your faith falls apart, and somebody, well, meaning that they are, says, hey, you probably have never been a real Christian to begin with, and we baptize you again. But nobody disciples you. Nobody teaches you. This is the way it's going to be. This is how it is. And so at 25, you have another crisis because trying to live a 25-year-old life with a 15-year-old understanding of God doesn't work. You have another crisis at 40, another crisis at 55. We keep baptizing you over and over again. We've got Baptists who are all wrinkled up because they've been in the water so much. <laughs> Nobody tells you you're supposed to fall in love with Jesus again. You're supposed to understand him at a deeper level. I've been married to Jeannie almost 37 years now. There are times I look at her and I fall in love with her all over again. We don't go back and get married again. I don't tell her I love you now as I have never loved you. We must have never been married up to this point. Let's go get married again. 
No, it's supposed to happen. You're supposed to fall in love again. You're supposed to keep following Jesus and learning more about Him and growing deeper in Him, becoming more and more like Him. You're supposed to be surprised by that, overwhelmed by that. That's the way your life is supposed to be. We don't know that Jesus keeps coming. We don't realize that Jesus won't let you alone. All of us have that room in our heart where we won't let Jesus go, right? Come on now, it's just you and me. Let's not pretend you have a place in your life where you say, Jesus, you cannot touch this. I'll be obedient to you in every area of my life, but I will not let you touch this. Perhaps somebody's hurt you in the past and you will not forgive them. Perhaps somebody has been some mistake that you won't deal with. Some sin, some, some little private thing that you keep, hey, this is mine, Jesus, it's behind that locked door. You can't go there. Guess which door Jesus will go to first? Because he's Lord. Do you know what that word Lord, Lord means? Owner. Boss. That's what it means. Did you notice what word they didn't use when they talked about Jesus? Who is this? Oh, this is a son of David. Who is this? Oh, this is a prophet. There are few words that you never want to be called. Prophet is one of them. It usually means we find you entertaining. We find you interesting, but we're not going to listen to you. We're not going to do anything. You know, we've got people now that are saying Christians should stay off of social media, that nothing good happens on social media, uh, that, that it's all negative, it's all dangerous, you need to stay off of that stuff. And, and we go and we hear them talk, and boy, they'll talk about social media, and they'll rail, and we'll say amen, and we'll say, that's interesting. Isn't that curious? We're not going to do it. That's a prophet. So Jesus says, if you, have one, if you have two coats, give one away. Well, isn't that interesting, Jesus? We're not going to do it. If somebody slaps you on one cheek, turn the other. Well, isn't that an interesting response? We're not going to do it. He's a prophet. But Jesus comes as Lord. He comes because Jerusalem belongs not to Rome. Jerusalem belongs to Jesus. The people there, they belong to him. And he keeps coming. Why? Because you belong to to him. He paid for you. He bought you. He owns you. He owns me. And this morning he has come with the most frightening invitation. Jesus would like to have a word with you. Nothing is more frightening. You've been called on the carpet. I've been called on the carpet. You've been working somewhere and the boss man won't mind and say, hey, I need to see you in my office. That's never good. <laughs> that's never, that's never good. So how can it be good when Jesus comes here this morning, this moment, and says, I'd like to talk to you. Why don't we sit down and have something to eat and we'll talk. Do you know how many of the great conversations in the Bible happened over food? This is Psalm 23. <laughs> he prepares a banquet for me in the presence of my enemies. <laughs> have you ever thought about what that means? You ever given your imagination time just to dwell on that? Yeah, you're in a foxhole, right? You're out of ammo. You're not going to make it. 
please, Jesus, come save me. Please, I'm surrounded. I'm outmanned. I'm outgunned. I'm not going to make it. And Jesus shows up. Yay, yay, we're going to win. Jesus is here. And the first thing Jesus says, are you hungry? Whoa, hold on, Jesus. Do you see all those people? They're not friends of mine. We're not, no, no, we're going to eat. We'll deal with enemies later, but right now we're going to eat. Peter betrays Jesus. Jesus finds him, cooks him a meal. And over the meal, he calls Peter back to the ministry over and over again. Heaven is described as what? A great banquet. So Jesus comes, and Rome couldn't keep him out. He didn't come to fight. He came to forgive. He came to restore. He came to love. Amen. Amen. And he knows you forget that. He knows I forget it. So he gave us the bread and he gave us the cup to remind you that nothing you have done will keep him away from you. Nothing anybody else ever does will keep him away from you. He will keep keep coming. And he's come now this morning. He'd like to have a word with you. So come now and sit at his table. The deacons will be preparing to serve you. Use these moments to prepare your own heart for the receiving of the bread and the cup. Lord Jesus, we're here at your table. Lost, broken, messed up sinners all. We can't run from you. We can't hide from you. Your grace won't let us go. So as we take the bread and as we take the cup and we remember the moment you surrendered to the sacrifice, may, be this, may this be our moment of surrender to you. Lover of our souls. Amen.
So you go to your favorite restaurant, and the first thing they bring you is bread. Something to get you used to eating. Something to get you warmed up for the feast that's to follow. Sometimes it's the best part of the meal. On the night he was betrayed, Christ took a piece of bread and he broke it and gave it to his disciples. He said, take this bread and eat it. It is a taste of things to come. The body of Christ, broken for you. Take and eat all of it. As the bread becomes part of our own body, as your life becomes part of ours. We pray, Lord, that it is your love, your hope, your mercy, your grace that lives in us and flows from us to a world in desperate need of it. We pray this in your name. Amen.
So the other day I'm talking with a friend and he turns and introduces me to a guy who's standing there and he says, with his wry smile, said, you don't want to mess with him. He's a seal. Okay. He said, but he's a good guy. He's a seal medic. He put them back together. We started talking about some of the adventures that this guy had been on and how important it was to be able to start an IV under fire so that the wounded soldier could get a transfusion of blood or they would die before they got back to base. Life's tough. You get wounded a lot. You bleed a lot. And if you're not careful, you'll die before you get back to base. His blood ran from the cross, pulled on the hill there. And now from there runs into you and me, this divine transfusion that makes us alive. The blood of Christ said for you to cover all of your sins. Take and drink all of it. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, just thinking about your own life this morning. Somehow, some way, Jesus has come to you. And that calls for some kind of response. For some of you, it's as simple as becoming a part of Brentwood Church. The Lord has confirmed in you, these are the people I want you to live with. These are the people I want you to do life with. So you come. We would love to get that process started. Others? Well, Jesus has come again. Before you have been afraid, you wouldn't talk with him. Before you didn't know what to say, now you understand he has come to rescue you, not to condemn you, to save you, not to judge you that in his death he paid for all of your sins and mistakes and in his resurrection gives you a life of hope and purpose you didn't even know was there, but is yours for the asking this morning. Now I know, I'm saying a whole lot and a handful of words. That's why our ministers, our counselors are waiting for you. They're standing at a table that says, next step. Go and say, I want to know more about what Mike was talking about. Let him pick up the conversation from there. But I beg you, do not leave this place. For Jesus' invitation to you, unanswered. He waits for you where you are. The church waits for you as you come. Lord Jesus, every life is now open, every heart. So we pray the choices we make now are exactly what you want. We stand together. Let's sing this together as a church family. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. 